Good evening and welcome everyone. I am Terry Kay of the Jewish Grandparents Network. And tonight we have another webinar in the Family Room Live series. Our guests are Dr. Betsy Stone and Erica Harubi. Uh, I wanted to say that tonight we proudly present this event in partnership with the Jewish Teen Education and Engagement Funder Collaborative. We are also delighted to welcome our wonderful board member, Lisa Brill, who will introduce our experts in a moment. Uh, we also have as one of the uh, hosts tonight, our CEO, David Raphael, and he may put his, web, his video on if he chooses. Uh, David is also the co-founder of the Jewish Grandparents Network with Lee Hendler. First, before we jump into our program, I would like to, oh, hi, David. I would like to take you inside the family room for a quick moment. It's available for you to explore. The family room is a place for you, the, grand, the Jewish grandparent, to find all kinds of experiences and activities and resources that you can share with your grandchildren. I'm going to um, point you to one experience because it was written by one of our presenters, Erica Ruby. Uh, if you take a look at the family room, you can see we have various destinations. There's family stories, cooking and food, gardening in the earth, play, and so on. Erica wrote an experience for us. Actually, it's insights into how to connect to your teen grandchild, five ways to do that, how to get into their world. That's just one example of what's in the family room. And a little bit later in chat, I will post the link so you can go and explore it on your own. Uh, one last thing about the family room, it's asynchronous, meaning you choose the experiences that interest you and you do them in your own time. Now to tonight's event. Uh, as I said, we're in webinar format, which means that all our participants, that's you, are uh, muted and videos are off. We, having said that, we would love to have your questions, so please write them in the chat box and we will take them throughout. Now over to Lisa Brill, who will introduce our facilitators, Betsy and Erica. Lisa is an active philanthropist who has been deeply involved in the Jewish community since high school. She is vice chair of the Brill Family Charitable Trust and is a board member of the JCC Association. Lisa is also a member of the Jewish Grandparents Network board. Lisa lives in Atlanta, and her greatest joy is being grandma to her two grandchildren. Over to you, Lisa, to introduce Betsy and Erica. Thanks, Terry. Good evening, everybody. I just want to first tell you how happy I am, be, I am to be here this evening representing Jewish Grandparents Network and all of the amazing programs that they have brought and that will continue to bring to Jewish grandparents everywhere. As a proud grandma to both a tween, an almost 12-year-old, and a teen, um, a 14-year-old, I am particularly happy to be participating in tonight's event. Um, our, our kids, our grandkids have really, as we know, gone through a rough couple of years. Above and beyond all the normal anxieties and pressures they would have faced in, in a regular living situation. And having had a previous conversation with both Betsy and Erica, I can assure you that we are all in for a most informative event. So let me tell you a little bit about tonight's presenters. Dr. Betsy Stone, I'm gonna read some of this, is a retired clinical psychologist and adjunct lecturer at HUCJIR teaching pastoral and developmental to topics in the School of Education. Bet Betsy teaches extensively on topics of trauma, adolescent spirituality, Gen Xers as parents, many of us, most of us I would say have, teenagers and their brains, leadership in crisis and stress and anxiety. So I asked each of our presenters, um, 
to tell me something that you might not know or couldn't find on their resumes. Betsy's, I don't, I, I have to say, I don't quite understand as a chocoholic. Betsy doesn't like chocolate. And during COVID, um, Betsy bought an ice cream maker and at the store had an extremely difficult time finding ways to make ice cream without some chocolate product, but has managed to make her favorite vanilla and Robin's eggs with the malted milk in it, uh, malted milk balls in it. So again, I, I have to say, Betsy, in all honesty, I don't understand not liking chocolate. So you open my eyes to something totally new. Erica Ruby is a tween teen expert with over 25 years of professional experience working directly with parents and tween teens in community, academic, and residential environments. Erica is founder of Anchored Parenting LLC. She has a master's degree in clinical psychology. I too asked Erica, tell us something we won't find on your resume. And first of all, tonight I found out that she lived in Atlanta and um, for many years, which is where I'm based. But most interesting is Erica and her husband and family live in an RV live a very minimalist lifestyle on the west coast of Florida, very near to the beach. And her two girls have now <clears throat> gone to college and beyond, but they still live in the RV, which if you look behind her closely enough, you might see a little bit. Um, so I am beyond thrilled um, for all of us to hear and learn from both Betsy and Erica, and I turn it over to you ladies. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you to David and to Terry and to Lisa, and a special thank you to my partner in crime. I love working with Erica. I feel very, very blessed. Um, what we're going to, the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna do, uh, I'm gonna do a little bit of the, um, stuff that doesn't make us happy right now. I'm going to talk about stress and anxiety, and I'm going to talk about some of the psychological things that we are seeing in children, um, in teens and tweens these days. Um, and then Erica is going to talk some about social media. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about mental health challenges, and Erica is going to give us great advice. Um, so let me start by um, distinguishing for you between stress and anxiety. For a lot of our children, there is a, almost a fusion of these two concepts, and they're actually very different in psychological literature. Um, stress is actually physically good for you. Um, it it um, kicks up your immune system. It actually is the the experience that gets you to act on on things you don't want to do. So when I if I have a paper to write, um, the stress is the thing that makes me write the paper. It's not bad for us in the short run at all. Um, it's the it is in some sense the accelerator of um, of human behavior. So that. Um, when it's time to make dinner, it's stress that gets you to start cooking. Um, and when it's time to write that paper, it's stress that gets you to write the paper. And stress actually lives in the present and the very near future. That's how we experience stress. Anxiety, on the other hand, isn't healthy. Um, anxiety is the experience <clears throat> of looking far down the road and seeing disaster after disaster after disaster. In many, in most situations, anxiety actually stops me from acting rather than encourages me to act. So it, for again, this adolescent who has to write a paper, stress is, is I have to do it, I just have to do it, I don't care, I'm gonna get it done, that's stress. Anxiety, which lives in the more distant future is, I, I don't know how to write the paper. I'm not a good writer. This teacher hates me. I'm going to do poorly on this on this paper. I'm going to do poorly in this class. I'm not going to get into college. I might as well go work at McDonald's. Anxiety lives far in the future, and what it ultimately does in the present is it where where stress is the accelerator, anxiety is the break. Um, one of the issues that we see in adolescence today is, an, is a difficulty in dealing pro appropriately with stress. 
the way we learn how to deal with stress is by building stress muscles, by experiencing stress and managing myself and being successful in my behavior. So that when we try to protect our children from stressful or difficult challenges, part of the message that they get from us is that we don't think they're capable of doing the things that they need to do. When, as, as we grow up, um, and this doesn't stop just because we're considered adults, we are always going to have experiences of stress. And um, the way we get better at handling stress is by handling stress. So the, the goal cannot be to avoid stress. The goal is to avoid anxiety, and they, they are very different. One is a diagnosable disorder, and the other is an absolutely normal part of, of our daily lives. Um, so uh, we wanted to start with that idea because we want to start with the concept that struggling with things is not a bad is not a bad experience for our children or for us. In fact, struggling with things is one of the ways I build strength. When we think about um, COVID and the experience of the last two years, this is not stress. This, is, this has gone way beyond what we would consider a normally stressful situation. And what we're seeing um, that comes out of both camps and schools is a, a number of different ways in which kids are manifesting um, the impact of the length and, and difficulty of this traumatic experience. Um, we're seeing significantly increased anxiety in kids and their parents, um, anxiety about sending kids to school, about sending kids to camp, um, about um, managing myself in social situations. I think that's something that we're also seeing in adults. When you think about being in a social situation with lots of people, you get the heebie-jeebies now in ways that you might not have had before. Um, that's, the, our, our children are also experiencing that and they may not know how abnormal that is for them. Um, we've seen an increase in both eating disorders, that's a diagnosable disease, disorder, and disordered eating. Now, most of us actually do engage in disordered eating. Um, disordered eating is eating when you're not hungry, eating when you're scared or frightened or happy, or um, and not stopping when you're full. Ordered eating is I eat when I'm hungry, I stop when I'm full. Uh, most of us do not do that, um, but we've seen an increase in disordered eating and in eating disorders. We've seen an increase in anxiety. We've seen, interestingly, um, during, the, during the more intense times of the pandemic in the true lockdowns, we saw a decrease in suicides um, across age groups, although I, I'm, I find that I think that isolate, that people who were isolated did have um, some increase. I just can't find the data to support that belief. It is my belief. Um, we have seen an, a significant increase as lockdown has lifted or lifted and then gone back and lifted and gone back um, in physical threats and behavior, not suicidal threats and behavior only, but physical threats from kids to adults where we would never have historically seen a third grader threaten to hit a teacher, or that was very rare. We're seeing that kind of stuff a lot. And that may, that's, you know, we've also seen increases in crime that's, um, and, and violent crime on the streets. Um, so what, one of the things I think that that speaks to is our decreased ability to control ourselves. Um, and that, that I think is true in the third grader, and I think it's true in most of us. Um, we've seen what is, it, uh, what is called in my business mo em emotional dysregulation, the inability to actually manage my own feelings. Um, the, that may come out as impulsivity, it may come out as screaming, it may come out as yelling, um, but this, the, the inability to manage my own discomfort is something that we're seeing, again, across the age spectrum. One of the fascinating things that came out of camps, we, as kids were going into camps, I think a lot of us who are interested in teenagers were spending a lot of time thinking about um, body image issues. 
um, because nobody had seen me except from you know my armpit up and for our, for lots of our kids the body they went into lockdown with was not the body they came out of lockdown with whether it was about weight or or height or breast size or facial hair um, and we thought that there'd be more body image issues um, I think that there were some of those but one of the things that was surprising that absolutely came out of camps um, and we're seeing in increasing numbers is kids who are really who are questioning their gender identity um, that there are more kids saying, I want to talk about my pronouns. There are more kids saying, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm non-binary, I'm not female, I'm not male. Um, and those questions about identity, look, we've always, in adolescence has always been a time when there's questions about identity. Questions about identity are at a physical level as well as at multiple other levels. Um, and I don't think we know why that is. Um, but we, that continues to happen as kids um, in, in school settings as well as in camp settings. Um, so Erica's going to share with us some, some information about social media at this point, and then you'll get me back. And actually, before I do that, I just want to let everybody know, I know that this is in webinar form, so we're not able to see you, but we do want to encourage you to ask questions. We are happy to put aside what we have prepared because we want to be responsive to what you're interested in talking about and the questions that you have. So if you have a question, we'll uh, go ahead and put that question in the chat or send it to any one of our um, moderators on the panel, and we will do our best to respond to it in a way that's generalizable so that it may be somebody's specific question, but it's something that other people can learn from and apply to their own lives as well. Um, so yes, feel free, do that at any point, and we're happy to um, engage with you in that way. So I want to talk a little bit now about social media. Um, I know social media is not new to any of you, and you have probably come, become more expert in social media than you ever imagined yourself to be. And I want to say that if that's something that you're doing as a way to interact with your tween or teen, that's incredibly exciting and helpful. So know that while social media does have some challenges, which I'm gonna share with you in just a moment, there are some positive aspects as well. So let me start with some of the positives that we've seen in social media. So one of those positives is that it has created an extended community and sense of belonging for many tweens and teens. And what I mean is there are lots of teens and tweens who have interests in all different areas, maybe Dungeons and Dragons, maybe they're into fashion or makeup or knitting or crocheting, whatever it is, they don't always find local people who are interested in some of those specialized interests, but they are able to find those people online and that really helps them connect and nourishes those interests and behaviors. A second uh, positive from social media is that it creates an additional support network that might not be available locally. So there may be some kids who are apprehensive about talking about issues or concerns with those who live or exist nearby, but social media provides a more anonymous in some places and safe space for them to be able to reach out and to connect over some of those concerns or issues. And the third thing I want to point out is that it also extends the social network beyond home friends and does help with social isolation and loneliness. What the research tells us is even kids who are online 
still find and are reporting that they are more lonely now than they have been in the past, but it is a place where they can connect. It is a place that if they're not comfortable with those around them, or maybe they don't have that good connection or support network, they are able to reach out beyond and make real connections in a way that are meaningful to them in that moment. It's not a replacement of people who are actually living around them, but it can sustain them and create opportunities for them to not feel as isolated as maybe some of our tweens and teens feel, um, especially with COVID. Some of the cons are not going to be so surprising to you. Um, many of the teens that are on social media, while they want to be on social media, they exist, they thrive in social media, they equally are creating feelings of envy, inadequacy, and are often reporting lower life satisfaction. Why? Because of social comparison. So when I'm online as a tween or teen, I'm typically showing my best face. I'm showing my best outfit, the day that I looked most perfect. And that's what I'm sharing. And as another teen sees that person, online living their best life, there's often that envy that, wow, they live this perfect life. My life isn't nearly as perfect. There must be something wrong with me. And the third one, and probably even most, like most, most important um, as far as a negative impact is the impact on sleep. Our tweens and teens are not getting the sleep that they need to be psychologically healthy, to be nurtured, to be able to think and process in a way where they can be their best selves because they find themselves online or wanting to stay online, wanting to stay up later and engage. And so we have to be really careful and thoughtful about how social media impacts sleep. In a nutshell, here's the good and the bad of it. Social media, it's not going away. Not only is it not going away, there are more and more ways in which young people can engage online in different ways. So we have to understand it's here to stay and think about ways that we can make sure that we're encouraging our tween and teen grandkids to be able to use social media to the best of its function so that they can be as healthy as possible. We need to support them using social media in a healthy way. We need to help them understand that it's okay not to be on social media all the time. My youngest daughter, who's now 22 years ago, when I got on Twitter, I'm sure many of you know about Twitter, I said, hey, aren't you on Twitter? And she's like, no. And I said, why? Like, you're a kid. What are you doing? Why aren't you on Twitter? And she said, because I know I will get sucked down the rabbit hole and I'll never be able to get out. And she made a conscious effort not to get on Twitter because she understood what it could do to her. And she said, you know what? Maybe some of those other social media platforms I can control. This one, not so much. So I think I'm just gonna avoid it altogether. And there are actually many famous people, many YouTubers and people that our young people are familiar with who are taking social media breaks. And so let's encourage our grandkids to take those social media breaks. Maybe it's just for Shabbat. Maybe it's for a week. Maybe it's for a month, whatever it is, sign out and engage in the real world, engage in the physical world, and really encourage them to move beyond that phone and out into the world to interact with other human beings around them, both their peers and um, supportive, loving adults. So one of the striking things about what Erica's just said, of course, it is really good advice, and it is extraordinarily difficult because every one of the social media platforms that any of us approach are designed to create addiction. That they, they are very intentional. 
Um, and so they are paying attention. The people who are putting Twitter together or Instagram together or TikTok together, they are paying attention to how our brains work. And the reason, and they reward us for staying by giving us something else, another kitten um, video or whatever it is that you click on. Um, it is designed to make you want more. And so, we, and we know that adolescent brains are actually more susceptible to addiction than adult brains. Um, and so that temptation, that come hither, is really, it's in the system and it's designed to be there. Um, to simply be able to say to yourself, I know this is too much for me, is, um, is, is quite a lot of personal strength. Um, and it can create um, social problems for kids. And so let's be aware that if your kid says what Erica's kid said, there are going to be conversations that they're left out of. There are going to be experiences that they don't know about. And that's going to be challenging for them. Because one of the things that, one of the confu confusing aspects of being an adolescent is that you want to be like everybody else and utterly unique all at the same time. This is not possible, and yet it is their goal. Um, I want to respond to some of the questions that are in the chat box. It, Erica, if there's ones you want to take, go ahead. Um, we can do these back and forth if you'd like. Um, one person asks, what, how do you help kids if a parent has constant anxiety? Um, first of all, that, I think one of the I think one of the most challenging aspects of being a grandparent is actually understanding the limitations of the role, um, and that in fact I can't make my grandchildren's lives I can make their lives better, but I can't fix their parents. Um, I think one of the most challenging parts of being a parent is realizing that your children are who they are, not, and that my Pygmalion skills failed me, um, and that I was unable to create the perfect children and the first perfect parents. Um, so let's start with understand the limitations of the role. If a child is not coming to you and complaining about mom's anxiety or dad's anxiety, I'm not sure I'd go there. Um, because what they really need from us as grandparents is love and support, love and support, love and support. And, the, and it, it, in any way that I undermine um, the parent, their parents, I'm not offering them love and support. Unless they come to me and say, you know, mom's always nervous, I think I would then respond to that. Um, but I think it is really important that grandparents understand that in most circumstances, one of the things we have to do is to support parents. Um, that, that, that if we undercut parents, we are actually undercutting children. Erica, you want to take one and then I'll, I'll go? You're muted. Of course I am. <laughs> Why wouldn't I be? Um, yeah, I'm just scanning through here now. We have a few questions or we have a question on um, overeating. And I think the question without answering it directly, I think a lot of what Betsy said is actually applicable in this area as well. Um, just because we notice something that looks a little bit off or a little bit different to us doesn't necessarily mean that it's a problem or problematic behavior. And so I think um, just to, to respond to that question, um, you know, there is very little that we can do as grandparents, especially if grandparents aren't living in the same area as their grandkids to control any kind of day-to-day -day eating behaviors or monitor any kind of eating behaviors. So I think in many ways, it's really about helping grandkids understand um, through their parents, um, I would encourage, what healthy eating behaviors look like, 
what are they seeing in the world that's informing their decision of what to take in? And we know that kids aren't doing the shopping, right? And so most of the time, if our, our grandkids are taking on any kind of negative eating behaviors, it really doesn't begin with them. But I would say sort of going back to what I said earlier with encouraging grandkids to really experience the world, much of, um, much of what we've seen over many, many years um, in this domain um, has to do with our grandkids being sedentary. So when I was growing up, TV was very popular. So everybody just sat on the couch and ate their, you know, pop tarts and cereals and whatever. And we didn't get out and we didn't do. And so replace television now with social media, with computers. And so we, we're seeing a lot of very sedentary behavior. So as we can encourage our grandkids in productive, healthy ways, to really get out, to do, to take on maybe a club at school, to get involved in some kind of healthy physical behavior, that will help balance out most of the time any possible issues related to some overeating or some of those eating behaviors. The other thing to think about that we need to think about in terms of weight behaviors um, is that Trauma, and the last two years have been trauma, um, makes people gain weight. Not everyone gains weight, some people lose weight, but most people gain weight as a response to trauma. Um, that is actually, I believe, because your brain is, a, over millennia, people um, died of accident and they died of age and they died of illness, but historically people, and we, we don't do this anymore. Most of the people who are on here don't die of famine. Um, there are lots of people in the world who die of famine still. One of the things that your brain actually tells you not in words um, when you're under great duress is that you should put on fat because fat will keep you alive. Um, and so we should, I mean, I, I think probably most of us have had a new relationship with food over the last two years. And that I don't see why our children should be exempt from that. There are also are times in the lives of children where they are chunkier and then less chunky and chunkier and less chunky. And we, we've his, we always have seen that, um, that, you know, kids who are, a, who are about to have a growth spurt may actually bulk up before they grow, bulk up this way before they grow up this way. Um, it, I think that, I think we get ourselves in real trouble when we comment on, um, on adolescents' bodies. Um, and I would, I would suggest to you that this, is, this goes in the category of, I, I think it, but I don't say it um, in most cases. Um, the, the, an, another question here is wh what are some ways teens can cope with or treat emotional dysregulation? Um, so in the moment of emotional dysregulation, there's not much you can do. Um, it actually, the, because in the moment of emotional dysregulation, I'm too upset to think. Um, the most effective thing for adolescents, for any of us to do, is to, is to develop um, a skill with, with the language of emotion. So if I can articulate what I feel, I actually can create some space between me and the roiling emotions. Um, and the, so they're using emotional language, creating emotional literacy is actually very helpful for all of us, not just for our tweens and teens. Um, but I'm not convinced that that is a role that grandparents necessarily fall into, except when, not in talking about the, your grandchildren, but maybe more in talking about, for example, characters in movies. Um, I think you, I think you're going to do a whole lot better looking dumb um, when you say to them in in Canto, is Maribel happy or is she upset? Um, and having them 
look, the dumber you are, the more you, the more questions they will answer for you. Um, and so I would, um, I, I would suggest that that can be actually very useful. L emotional literacy is, is, um, is a really important skill for children and adults. Um, you want to take another one or should we keep going? I, I'm looking at Terry and trying to figure out what, what you want us to do here. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I would keep going with what you prepared and I'll keep an eye on, on the question. Okay, okay. So um, my turn then. Um, we're going to um, talk a little bit about the mental health challenges of this year, of these last two years. Um, and th these have been extraordinary. Our children are isolated. Um, they are sad. They are watching parents um, be struggling. And the, the, one of the things we know is that the more parents struggle, the more kids are struggling. That should, that's almost simplistic, but absolutely true. Um, we have, as we enter this new phase of, um, of reopening, of unmasking, of, oh, you know, this new transition that many of us are in. I, I think that the politicians and the pundits have be, been telling us that when we unmask, our children will feel better. And I think that's nonsense. I think that we, um, that we are looking at a decade of people processing what has happened um, to one degree or another. Um, I think that this is the trauma of a generation and that it behooves us not to think about returning to normal, but about creating the next normal and, the, and figuring out what our children actually need as opposed to what trying to recreate what was. None of us are who we were when we went into lockdown two years ago, two years ago. Um, and we, we know that both socially and educationally, our children are far behind where they would have been historically. Um, I, I've been saying to people f um, a lot, if you have a 10th grader in, in your space, you actually have an eighth grader developmentally. Um, on a good day, that we not only have had significant learning loss across the board, but we have had significant socialization loss. Um, and we, we won't catch up just by being in spaces together. In fact, if you think about what it feels like for adults to be in shared spaces and how anxious it can make us and how poor we are at um, small talk and some of the very core social skills that we've always relied on to engage with each other um, and to feel seen by each other. We don't have those skills and our kids don't have those skills. Um, and we can bemoan it or we can respond to it. Um, I, 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 it seems completely clear to me that our schools need a whole lot more um, social workers and counselors and a whole lot less focus on curriculum and testing because our kids will fail the tests um, but they but, but they can learn how to um, they can relearn social skills they can learn new social skills um, the data on trauma sensitive schools talks about adapting and adapting and adapting um, and trying to um, force an old model on people who have been in, um, in, in, in our ongoing trauma, I just think is gonna be terribly unsuccessful. Um, I think we have to really work hard on building connection with our kids. I think we have to really work hard on helping them develop some skills of autonomy um, the, some independence, some sense that they can do things on their own, um, a sense of autonomy, a sense of belonging, which I think 
requires a, a, a community and a sense of competence. And um, if I could, those are for me, the kind of the ABCs, autonomy, belonging, and competence. And we will, and we, and the way we do that with our children um, is by letting them stumble, letting them fail, helping them pick themselves up and move on. Um, a lot of that job is particularly easy for grandparents because the core requirement for grandparenting is love. And everything else is an add-on. Um, but if I love you, love you, love you, as opposed to judge you, judge you, or, um, or give you useful feedback, um, if I love you and love you and love you, I am building a lap for you um, that will sustain you in and, and help you feel that, that sense of belonging. So it's, yeah, Eric, imagine yeah. since Jake, um, one of our participants, Martin, phrased it quite beautifully, he said two helpful keys for us as grandparents, be honestly curious and non-judgment, non-judgmental. And those are those are wonderful skills, and when you and when you do them, if you fall off the off the wagon on this, get back on. One of the things that we often do is we say I'm going to not be non-judgmental, and then I hear the judgment come out, and I say, well, I'm just going to keep going that way, right? Like I'm I I'm, I ate one Oreo, I should eat the whole bag. Um, when you fall off the wagon, get back on. Um, I'm going to put my, Esther, I'm going to put my ABCs in the, um, in the chat box. Um, lots of kids under eat, lots of kids overeat. If you're, if you're not dealing with a kid who's diagnosable with an eating disorder, just don't let, don't be bothered by it. Most kids have, most kids and most adults have days they are hungrier and days they are less hungry. Um, and we tend to say we need to eat a good breakfast, a small lunch, a big dinner. Um, I don't know where that comes from, but you don't need to do that. Go. So Erica, how are we gonna, how are we gonna take us home with you with great advice? Yes, absolutely. So I just want to remind all of you that as grandparents, most of you are probably not the primary caregiver of your grandchild. And being the person who isn't the primary caregiver, who isn't the primary disciplinarian, who doesn't have that adversarial sometimes relationship with that tween or teen, really positions grandparents in a very unique and special position to be able to help support and guide and be really present for their um, tween and teen grandchild. So thinking about that for a moment, I wanna give you seven suggestions for ways in which grandparents can support their tween and teen grandchildren. And I'm gonna send these seven points along to Terry so that she can share those out after, um, after the session over the next couple of days. But the first piece of advice is that grandparents can play a unique role by spending some one-on-one -on -one time with their tween or teen grandchild. Often our, our grandchildren are in multiples, right? Like many people have one, but there are others who have two kids, three kids, etc. And so when they're in their family, their core unit, they're often not able to have any kind of unique individual time. And so whether you're local and can spend time by taking them out to a special dinner or a special lunch, or whether you're far away and just take the time to maybe Zoom with them or chat with them and connect with them one-on-one, -on -one, that's something really special that grandparents can do to really help highlight each of our grandkids' uniqueness and special qualities and talents. The second piece of advice is that grandparents can play that promoter and supporter role. You can be your grandkids' biggest cheerleader. 
and they love to have that support. Again, they're having it from their parents, but often we know that parents are very, very busy with work, with other things, with other obligations that are going on. So when we can really turn up the temperature as grandparents and help tune in to what the grandkids are doing and really support them and tell the world how proud we are of them, but not just tell the world, tell them to really get in there and to own it and to be present with them is so incredibly important. The third piece of advice, which somebody already brought up, I think it was Martin just a minute ago, um, and then Betsy um, tuned into that as well, is opening those non-judgmental arms. Grandparents, all of us, have been through our period of growing up. We all made choices. Some of those choices were good. Some of those choices weren't very good, but we learn from them, we grow from them, and it's healthy to have them. So we want to be there to support our tween and teen grandchildren as they engage with the world, as they explore the world in healthy ways, be present, be available for them to really check out and listen to what's going on in their lives and to hear without the lens of you need to do this or you need to do that, rather be in that non-judgmental, open and accepting space. The fourth thing that grandparents can do to help um, their grandkids is to humanize their parents. <laughs> Often, tweens and teens look at their parents as these people who just roam the earth to make their lives miserable. <laughs> well, Grandparents, you're in the perfect role to say, hey, they were actually like you when you were younger. And so help your grandkids understand their parents' human side, that they also made mistakes, that they also sometimes did things that weren't perfectly well um, orchestrated or thought out, but that you supported them as well. And to really help them share stories about their parents growing up so that they can learn to connect with them in a slightly different way than what they experience on a daily basis. The fifth thing is that grandparents can be great listeners. Yes, we talked about being non-judgmental, but sometimes teens just want to be listened to. I am a teen coach and one of my teens who's 13 years old, she told me last week, sometimes I go to my parents and I just wanna tell them something. I don't want their advice. I don't want them to tell me what to do. I just wanna get it off my chest. So really be there as a listener, as that present listener, whether you're in person or on the phone or on Zoom, however you communicate, to be there to listen without giving advice, just to be there to tune into them. The sixth, and only one more after this, is that um, grandparents can actually offer, especially those who are local, can offer their grandkids a home away from home. Sometimes they just need to get out of that space that they're in all the time and just have their own separate space, maybe away from their parents, maybe away from their siblings, but make your home a home that we can really um, nurture and welcome those grandkids so that they know that there's an extra place or space that they can go to if they just need a little bit of downtime or a little bit of a break. And lastly, grandparents can really be um, those who can check in and tune in with what's going on. So if you see something, if you're really connecting on a regular basis, oftentimes grandparents might notice, maybe there's a little bit of a mood change. Maybe there's something going on that doesn't feel the same as always. Grandkids want to know that they're being listened to, that they're being noticed. And so if you say, you know, your mood seems a little bit different today, or you really 
seemed excited last week. Tell me what that was all about. Really connect in with their emotions to show them that you're paying attention. And when things feel off, own it. Ask the question. Don't let it go away. We want to make sure that our grandkids are, that we're noticing what's going on, that we're tuning into what's going on, and that we're present with where they are and what they may need in the future. Wonderful, Erica. Thank you so much. Those seven points are really useful. Um, know that you're not going to be, you're not, you don't get graded on this and you don't get an A at any of them. Um, and so pay attention to the kinds of responses that you get. Judith points out to us that some of our kids just respond to text monosyllabically. Yes, no. Um, I don't think I'd quit on that. I think that the fact that they're responding at all tells you that they're paying attention. Um, and I, so, yeah, go. Sorry, I just want to add to that is that actually the yes and no's are responses to close ended questions. So we might actually pay attention to the way in which we're phrasing the question, because if we're asking a yes and no question, they're going to take the easy way out. If we're asking a question that's open-ended, where they can't just say yes or no, then we're going to get a richer media response from them. The other, the other piece of this that um, that it's making me think of is <clears throat> that we there are ways that we can empower our grandchildren and therefore empower the relationship. If I don't know how to do something and you can teach me, or even if I do know how to do it and you can teach me. What that does is build bridges. Um, and we often are more outcome driven than bridge driven. Um, but the bridges are actually where the meat of relationship happens. So if I ask my grandchildren to d teach me to do something that I actually know how to do, what I'm doing is I'm, ex I'm making them into experts. I'm relying on them. I'm giving them a sense of autonomy and competence. Um, and I'm creating the belonging. It doesn't all have to be, um, it doesn't all have to be them talking to you. It also can be the, you, them helping you. Um, I want to respond to an earlier comment that was made um, that Ned and Gail Rosenberg made about gender confusion and gender norms. We don't actually know what whether or not this, there's an increase in, in the gender question. Um, the data on, um, on gays and lesbians has always been that about 10% of us are. Um, but I don't think that we know much about, there's not much data on people who fit in the non-binary or transsexual categories because we don't have a lot of experience with this because they've been underground, because they've been hidden, um, because people haven't told the truth about their own experiences. Whether this is driven by the media or it's driven by um, estrogen in plastic bottles, which is one of the hypotheses, um, it, it, I, ultimately, I'm not sure it matters because if you, you live in an environment where, and our kids do, where questions of gender identity, of racial identity, of, um, of gender preference are open questions, they're going to come up with open answers. And so it, it seems to me that in many ways, the cause of it may not be as important as the response to it. We are going to see increasing numbers of our, of our kids who are comfortable coming out, who are comfortable in interracial relationships, who are comfortable in open, more open relationships than we've seen historically. Um, and whether the cause is um, TikTok or social media or pornography or, or the presentation of people in ads, it doesn't matter. Not in terms of our relationship to them.
What matters in terms of our relationship to them is the space we make for them to share with us and the way we respect their sharing. Um, see before you continue, uh, just a quick announcement. We have five minutes left in our scheduled time. Um, I'm happy to stay on. I'm going to guess that Lisa and you and Betsy and, um, and Erica are, and David are comfortable staying on. To our, our participants, if you have to leave because, you know, it's eight o'clock, we, we thank you so much for being here. We're probably going to stay on an extra couple of minutes after that. If that's a, is, does that sound okay? Yep. Great. And if you do have to leave to our friends, uh, we, we, uh, we will follow up with an email. You'll be getting a couple of things from us. And we thank you so much for being here. We are going to continue for the next few minutes. I think there might be a question, and I don't know if you answered this, so tell me if you did. Where a participant asked, how do you advise a teen of divorce if one parent is modeling some questionable behaviors? Um, again, don't undermine parents. I mean, to the extent that you can do that, don't undermine parents. Ultimately, that's who they go home to. Um, and, and it's different if the, if the child comes to you than if you go to the child. It's very different. Um, I think that, um, that if the child comes to you and says, mom is doing or dad is doing and it's making me uncomfortable, um, that, that part of your job is to try to empower that child to talk to their parent. Um, how, how do you think you could have that conversation with mom or dad? Do you want me to be present when you have that conversation with mom and dad? Um, but not, um, but I, I would not raise these issues unless they are beginning to verge on danger. Um, and, and when we're in a situation where we're concerned about actual danger, you're in a wholly different category. Um, Erica, how would you answer that? Yeah, I, I would say the same thing. And I actually think that you're the last piece of what you said, Betsy, also responds to a question in the chat about when should you inform the parent if you notice something going on with a teen. And I would say only if there is a concern about safety, if it's an issue of the child's safety, if they're potentially saying things that could put their lives in, in danger, whether it's suicidal, whether there's cutting, there's certain behaviors that live in that realm, then absolutely their parents need to be involved. But otherwise, I would say this, what the conversations that you have with your grandchildren are conversations that should stay within the relationship of you and your grandchild. And that relationship is going to become stronger and more resilient and more powerful because they know that they can come to you with information that maybe they can't go to their parents with or aren't comfortable going to their parents with, but they know that you're a safe person who's gonna listen non-judgmentally and really help them figure things out. So, yeah. And in that arena, if a child comes to you, and now I'm not just talking about a grandchild, if a child comes to you and says, I want you to promise you won't repeat what I say, the answer is always the same. If it's not a safety issue, I will not repeat what you say. But you have to give yourself that out. Right, so can uh, I ask a quick question? Yes. So how does a parent or grandparent grandparent know when to draw the line to, to know when it is a safety issue or to recognize that point like, hey, I may be out of my league here. I need to speak to some professional who may be helpful. Well, so first of all, there is no perfect answer to this question. Um, and that's and that's a very important part of it. Um, dramatic changes in behavior. Um, a, a kid who suddenly um, uh, is really acting differently, um, a kid who is school phobic. But again, parents should be seeing this. And that conversation could then be happening between you and the parent. Hey, is Johnny okay? Because he's he's feeling really off to me. Um, and then um, and, and then stop and let them and see how much they want to, to use you as a resource. Um, 
if so, if you see that a kid is cutting, um, here's a really interesting factoid. Girls tend to cut on their limbs and boys tend to cut on their torsos. I don't know why that is. Um, is that data still accurate, Erica? Um, yeah, I, I actually haven't seen that before, so I'm going with you. Okay, um, and so you know, if a kid who um, who's wearing long sleeves in the summer, um, I I'm always curious. Um, but as, as but long it, as it's not the style, Betsy, because right yes. now the style is hoodies. So if you see your grandchild wearing a hoodie all the time, don't assume that they're doing any kind of negative behavior. Right. It could just be a sign of the times. <laughs> Absolutely. Because remember, they want to fit in desperately. They don't want to fit in with you. They want to fit in with their peers. They want you to love them. They want to fit in with their peers. So David, I think part of the answer to the question is in dramatic shift, right? Um, and, um, and part of the answer to the question is hopefully you build a strong enough relationship with your own child that you are able to be a resource, not only to your grandchildren, but to your children as well. Um, and that doesn't mean we approve of everything we, they do, and it doesn't mean that we, that we like all the choices that they make, but that the bond is strong enough that you're a resource to everybody who follows you. It's I think that's that. a conclusion. That's a conclusion. So I was going to say, <laughs> what do you want to wrap up with? That sounds to me. Erica, are there any final words before we bid good night to our friends? Um, I just want to thank everybody for being here tonight. I think just being here, being present in this conversation, asking really insightful questions and connecting with other people who have grandkids, your grandkids age. I think it's really important that you have a network of people who may be experiencing the same life transition as you are in this phase of your life. And I think they're great people to be able to bounce ideas off of as well and to really be able to check in. And so use your network of, of, of friends, of community members who may have grandkids in those same age brackets to really be there for um, for you to support you and guide you as you are on this new and ever changing journey of grandparenting. Thank you, thank you, thank you, friends. Um, I, I put in chat, and I want you to know that the Jewish Grandparents Network is is going to be presenting many more um, sessions like this. We're going to be facilitating conversations with the Union for Reform Judaism and Keshet. Um, on gender identity, and you uh, will hear about it from us. Uh, it's, it's quite important to our organization. With our many thanks to Lisa, to Betsy, to Erica, to David, and to all of you for joining us. You're going to be getting an email from me within the next 20 minutes with some follow-up materials and another one uh, with Erica's seven points uh, for, for engagement before the end of the week. So to all of you, good night. Thank you for being here. Good night and thank you for having us. Thank you. Bye.